Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome you to this event. Um, my name is Brady Pimiero Walkinshaw. I'm a member of GRIS Board of Directors and was previously CEO of this wonderful organization over five years. Um, we're excited to bring you this conversation on community based solutions to the climate crisis uh, produced in partnership with the Climate Justice Alliance. Over the years, GRIS has featured leaders, stories, and the vital work of, over set of the over 70 community based organizations in the Climate Justice Alliance's national network. We've done this in our editorial coverage and in the work that GRIST has produced through GRIST Solutions Lab, FIX, like the annual GRIST 50. As a media organization, GRIST has spent a lot of time reflecting how and when the term environmental justice, which has a deep history in community-based organizing, and when reporting stories and convening conversations like this one today. Last fall, uh, Gris convened a virtual conversation that was titled Carbon Removal in Environmental Justice. At the time, we made a mistake. We hosted a conversation, used the term environmental justice, and our panel failed to include community-based environmental justice leaders on a very important and at times controversial topic. By name alone, it wrongly implied that environmental justice communities supported carbon removal, and we know that it is a more complicated story. We're sorry, and we've been thinking through how we can improve in the future. The good news is, is that this led to a constructive conversation between the Climate Justice Alliance and GRIST, where we spoke about the HEMES principles, particularly that the relevant voices of people being directly affected are not only heard, but leading and brought in from the very beginning. If we had done this in the event in October of last year, it would have improved the caliber and the quality of the conversation. So we're looking forward as we look into the future at GRIST, how to hold ourselves more accountable in these events and work more broadly in media and journalism and hopefully inspire the field to do the same. As a media organization, as a member of GRIST board, um, I know that building trust takes time and actions speak louder than words. For this conversation today, this is the second in a series where we're aiming to explore solutions to the climate crisis. Today's conversation will focus on three extraordinary leaders behind community-based solutions facilitated by GRIS Editor-in-Chief and Interim CEO, Nikhil Swaminathan. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce my collaborator at the Climate Justice Alliance. She's the board, the board co-chair and also the executive director of UPROSE, based in Brooklyn, New York. And over to you, Elizabeth Dampierre. Thank you so much, Brady. Ashe Pueblo, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to share these words with you today. The Climate Justice Alliance is a member-led organization of 74 urban and rural frontline communities, organizations, and support networks in the climate justice movement. We work to advance real solutions to the climate crisis through building local, living, regenerative economies while pushing back against false promises originating from the fossil fuel industry and big business. The existing dig, burn, and dump economy and its efforts to justify this extractive mode of operating is entrenched in everything we do. We know this to the point that, e that it even impacts well-meaning folks who we have come to respect at GRIST. As a principle, we look at the larger picture always because as environmental justice communities, we understand the intersectional nature of our reality and the multidimensional impacts of frontline solutions. We see the root causes of the climate crisis as the entire system that got us here. They created the problem and we can't rely on them to fix it. They have the responsibility to do so. It is true, but not in superficial ways and not left to their own devices. Governments, corporations, and global bodies like the United Nations have approached the problem sadly from the perspective of saving the capitalist economy over saving people's lives and the planet. These are just band-aid approaches that don't actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the rate we need or strengthen communities' resilience. They simply put are false solutions dressed up in glitter and gold and called techno fixes. What we need at this critical juncture in history are real solutions that leave no one behind, that reduce emissions while building community wealth, 
that lead with justice for Mother Earth and everyone, especially Black, Brown, Indigenous, and low-income communities who have been historically harmed and systematically silenced. And we know this because we are grounded in the wisdom and experience of frontline communities and workers. We were born and raised and struggle in these communities. At CJA, we and others in the movement abide by the Hamez principles and just, and just transition principles, which lay out some, fu some key fundamental foundational organizing practices, such as letting those most impacted speak for themselves. Assessing and building solutions through a framework that centers frontline communities and their needs, voices, and knowledge, and ensuring no harm is a result of all of these critical components of our work. We often say that a transition is inevitable, but justice is not. So at every step, we have to build truly just transition projects and organizing pra practices. And we expect those who really want to solve the crisis to follow alongside us. In fact, we welcome them. So today, we're excited to be here at GRIS and in, with environmental justice leaders to dig into what truly just solutions for our communities look like, feel like, and explain why some of the most shiny and new big business solutions like carbon remo removal are just, just solutions, are false solutions, I'm sorry, um, that will only accelerate climate change. So thank you so much, and I'll share to everyone as we delve into this conversation. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm Nikhil Swaminathan. As Brady mentioned earlier, I am the Editor-in-Chief and Interim CEO of GRIST. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's watching on YouTube and Facebook and elsewhere for joining us for what I think is an, an extremely important conversation happening at an extremely important moment just days after um, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with their latest report on climate impacts and the urgency to act um, and to create a more just, just and sustainable world uh, has been ratcheted up. Uh, I'm so excited to be joined by uh, the frontline leaders who um, you'll hear from in just a moment. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. But beforehand, I want to let those of you who are watching know that we'd love for you to submit questions that we can um, talk through a little later in the event. Um, submit them via YouTube or Facebook comments. You can send Twitter replies. Uh, and we have a team sort of capturing those and going through them so that we can feature a few later in the discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to take a quick minute to introduce themselves. Um, and after we do that, we'll get into it. So uh, Tom, please take it away. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invite. Uh, I, I like to always uh, call upon our, our sacred eagle and our feathers, you know, to be with me. And everything that we do and everything I do have been taught has been uh, a spiritual context. And so, yeah, that's good morning in our, my mother's uh, Navajo language. The Bethlehemi Nashli, Walter Kota Bashishchi. Uh, uh, with a good heart, uh, I shake all of your hands. Uh, and I am the executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Network. Uh, we are grassroots uh, uh, network, uh, and uh, we are based here in Turtle Island, North America, but we also have constituency of indigenous peoples in the global south that we network with and we were formed in 1990 by the grassroots thank you casa please good afternoon i come to you from louisville kentucky um, on land that was once occupied by the osage miami cherokee shawnee and other indigenous nations I'm a proud Kentuckian. I identify as an abolitionist, do work as an urban planner and community organizer. And I have uh, been joyful to find community with uh, my comrades with CJA 
as the immediate past chair of Kentuckians for the Commonwealth. KMTC is a 40-year-old uh, grassroots member-led organization in Kentucky working to bring Kentuckians together across uh, a lot of difference to make our democracy and economy stronger. Thanks for having me. And last but not least, Maria. Cool stuff. Buenas, I'm Maria Lopez Nunez um, with Ironbound Community Corporation in Newark, New Jersey, in the Lenape land. Um, we're a 52 year old organization that fights incinerators, tries to grow healthy food, and really just tries to connect with our community and make sure that we can fight for ourselves and we defend ourselves constant under, of the constant threat of exploitation of the land that we live on. Thank you all. All right, everyone, as you can see, we have a really, really amazing panel, um, and I'm excited to get into the conversation with them. So I'm just going to go ahead and kick that off right now. Um, Tom, I'm coming to you if that's okay. Uh, in her in introduction, um, Elizabeth mentioned the HEMES principles and related frameworks that undergird the work that environmental and climate justice organizations like the Indig Indigenous Environmental Network um, performs. I'd love it if you could speak more specifically of how you and uh, your colleagues at IEN and all the different communities you work with um, operationalize those principles on the ground. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, during the formative years of the Indigenous Environmental Network that started 32 years ago, uh, we brought elders, youth, women and community-based uh, grassroots tribal members and tribal elected governmental leaders as well together to start a process to build alignment uh, for working for the rights of our indigenous peoples and for environmental and the economic justice and later in 1998 uh, for climate justice. Uh, starting in 1990 it was a five-year process of bottom-up uh, convenings, organizing uh, with the diversity of tribes, uh, the diversity around the, the list of the whole large list of uh, environmental justice issues uh, that uh, our peoples were experiencing in what we call Indian country. This led to the hiring of our first staff in 1996. So one of the principles established in 1991 uh, at a uh, Protecting Mother Earth uh, outdoor conference that we held in the sacred Black Hills in South Dakota was we speak for ourselves. That is the key principle of the Hemis principles. The early 1990s uh, was a time uh, we started to build alliances with the Black and people of color to confront environmental racism in America. It, it was a time for us to, to respond to the life and death issues that our communities are facing, were facing, and still are facing. Uh, the massive disparities and the burden of environmental degradation uh, and pollution uh, facing uh, our communities, including low-income communities. IEN and, and these other Black and people of color environmental justice networks and a lot of the other environmental justice organizations in each, each of the states that have been forming uh, had to constantly push the white national environmental organizations uh, to, 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 to bring more color into their boards and staffing and to be true allies uh, confronting environmental injustice. Uh, we had to push the, the green groups to be more accountable uh, Many of the white leadership within the green groups, the, the non-governmental organizations, the conservation groups, the environmental organization, they were starting to ignore uh, environmental racism as the main problem to address and downplayed it and said, well, it's a class issue, not necessarily a race issue. So there already were some lines being drawn within the environmental movement and later in the climate movement that uh, race wasn't uh, really a big issue that needed to be addressed. So I remember uh, the convening that we had in 1996 uh, 
and it, with our our sister alliances such as the Northwest, the Southwest, excuse me, the Southwest Network uh, for Environmental and Economic Justice, and others, other organizations. Uh, we had a meeting in Hemis Springs in New Mexico, uh, and invited the white uh, non-governmental organizations involved in border justice, uh, international trade issues, especially related to agriculture issues, but also seeds and, and other related issues to address the, 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 the need for meaningful participation of indigenous black and people of color and to develop uh, the principles of building solidarity, uh, mutuality and, and just relationships and uh, to take that deep dive with these folks in this uh, location to, to really ask the question, you know, uh, how, do, how do we work together? How do you incorporate principles of, of addressing environmental racism within your organization? So from that meeting came the Hemis principles. To this day, IEN and others in our climate justice movement, including uh, the other two representatives on this panel, we have to continually challenge the climate and environmental movement to listen to our frontline voices and to be included in their agenda. So, you know, it does get frustrating. It does get, uh, and it builds anger uh, from a lot of our communities. We're going on another generation of folks from our community standing up and organizing and asking these serious questions is, how do we get a response of respect uh, from, from the white uh, environmental organizations, conservation groups as well, organizations and uh, around these issues. And climate has been a big discussion, a lot of money being appropriated to, for, for organizations to address climate. So there's a lot of concerns we have, again, is how do we make the, the Hamas principles a real document uh, that needs to be embraced? Because in our analysis within the Indigenous Environmental Network is that we can't do this alone. Uh, we need uh, our, our, our brothers and sisters from the Black and people of color to stand together. We need the low income. We need to work with labor. We need to work also with the non-Indigenous allies that are out there. Uh, it needs to be around a framework of uh, building uh, respect and, and mechanisms for real accountability. You know, we, we do have uh, a lot of solutions that we bring to the table. Um, I'm going to check right there. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to move over to you, Casa. Um, I wanted to congratulate you and Kentuckians for the Commonwealth on a 40 year run. That is really, really Amazing. Um, and I, I would love to hear a bit about um, some of the recent work that the organization has done. Um, and I know there's been some conceiving and launching and executing of community controlled projects. And I, I, I'm just, I would love to hear a little bit more about them and sort of how they relate to some of the foundation that Tom just laid out for us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's it's kind of crazy to think that I was three years old when this organization started. And for 40 years, um, we've been organizing Kentuckians um, across difference towards a shared vision um, to connect us to do the things that we need to do. We, we first started with tax reform and it quickly turned into land access and land protection issues because coal companies we're extracting the natural resource from people's lands without permission, literally blowing up mountains and, and devastating the top, topography and natural habitats in, in eastern Kentucky, and then exporting um, that coal ash to the cities for, for folks like me to breathe, to breathe that. Um, in a state that's 88% white and an organization that's pretty um, uh, similar to that, KTC members are centering and being led by BIPOC leaders, folks who look like me. And we're working with community-based organizations. KTC is the statewide group. And we're working with community-based organizations and leaders to support them, support their leadership to do the things in their local communities that we know um, need to get done. So what does that look like? 
Um, it looks like 20 years ago when the tobacco companies were sued by the states and Kentucky got a big share of the tobacco master uh, settlement funds, we put that money back into ag agriculture. So instead of Kentuckians, Kentucky farmers growing tobacco and some a product that's going to kill us, um, we put forth a vision for local food systems and helping uh, farmers do great things on their farms again. And so what does that look like? That looks like being able to invest $23,000 in a wood-fired boiler for a small farm that's saving them $3,000 a year. Um, and then they're really able to reinvest that back into, into their farm. It also means that our rural electric co-ops have developed on bill uh, financing programs that allow homeowners um, who make, you know, pretty low um, amounts of money every year to be able to invest in um, energy retro retrofits in their house to save money um, that they're able to pay for that on their bill and save that money um, and reinvest that money back into their, their communities. Uh, it's not just folks in, in Kentucky, there are folks across, across the, the, the country that are doing projects like this. In, um, uh, in Arkansas, there's a Washitu um, electric co-op who has been able to partner with the company and invest in a solar, um, solar operations, which means that their local co-op is changing how they do business and they're able to reduce the amount of power that they're using during the peak demand, which is also then passing that savings on to their customers. Um, our friends in New York um, uprose when Superstorm Sandy happened. Uh, the community, community didn't just sit back and wait. Um, they talked to the folks at uprose and they organized and they created um, a new center for, for uh, the Sunset Park Climate Justice Center that was a result of organizing that really um, uh, allowed them to start the Sunset Park Solar um, Program, which is the first cooperatively owned community solar project um, there. What this means is that folks are using our own talents, our own ingenuity, the resources that we know are coming from the federal government to our local communities and using that to empower local people to make local solutions that we know are people powered, um, that are saving us, that are saving our lives, literally saving our lives and they're saving our, our money, saving us money and transforming our economy into, um, you know, a economy that's shared, that values people, that values our land, um, and that's really going to put us into um, the next generation. That is really exciting work, Casa. Um, I'm going to bring Maria into the conversation quickly, but I think we do want to go back to some of the um, exciting work that you just mentioned, Casa. But Maria, um, I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you've been doing with Ironbound. I know that you recently led a coalition that paused the approval of a fracked gas power plant in Newark. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Ironbound's work and specifically what happened in that particular fight? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I always try to take a step back first, right? To describe what Iron, like Ironbound, because I feel like Ironbound's the poster child for what is a sacrifice zone. You know, we use that term all the time, sacrifice zones. There's sacrifice zones all over the country. And in Ironbound, what that looks like is we're a four square mile neighborhood that has three natural gas plants. We have the largest garbage incinerator in our state. We have the largest sewage treatment uh, facility for the region. Um, we're right next to the port of Newark, New Jersey, where 80% of the consumer goods that come to the um, metropolitan area, they come through that port. And most of them, unfortunately, get on a truck to um, barrel through our neighborhood or the neighborhood right next to us um, in order to go to their final destination. You know, we have a fat rendering plant, um, a sludge plant that we're fighting, right? So it's this constant assault of toxic waste, also surrounded by the longest Superfund site in the country. So when we're talking about sacrifice zone. I never mention anything that's beyond our physical boundaries. And that's only because it's depressing. It's depressing how much concentration We've done it in just a small area where just black and brown people live, low income people live, you know, and we've been deemed to not have enough political power. So that's the context of us constantly fighting these false solutions that the natural gas plant was an example of. 
Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to stick with you because I want to um, I want to continue um, talking about the urgency of um, solutions to the climate crisis. I mean, uh, like I mentioned off the top, the UN, the new UN report that came out just over the weekend, um, it, the the clock is ticking and it's ticking more loudly than it has been. You know, every time one of these uh, reports comes out, the, it starts to tick more loudly. It felt like um, they, the scientists, the scientific community was telling us now or never. Um, and I'm curious then when you're confronting this issue from a place like Ironbound, you know, obviously the fracked gas plant was not your idea of a solution. So, um, what's, the, what are the alternatives and what are the people who are trying to to offer your community yet another plant? What are they totally missing? Yeah, you know, and I, I want to even go maybe wider because right now the talk, the main talk for fall solutions is this carbon capture, this carbon sequestration. This, I think for me, psychotic idea that instead of stop, stop digging the hole that we're in, people think we can come up with fancy technology, right? Um, instead of stopping our extractive economy, let's just technify it. And that way we never have to deal with the way we exploit the earth. You know, when I saw, when I've seen presentations on what does carbon sequestration look like, it looks like reverse fracking to me. You know, they use, they push the chemicals into the, into the earth to push that gas up. Well, they're trying to do the same thing with carbon. And obviously what they're missing is that we have a societal problem that we need to deal with. And then when people like Exxon are proposing solutions like carbon capture, carbon sequestration, that's to serve their interests. It's to divert attention from the harm that they've done to us. It's like when Coca-Cola in the 70s proposed recycling, when people were like, all these plastic bottles, they offered us recycling. And then what happened, right, is look at us now. There's microplastics in um, people's breast milk that they're feeding to their babies. There's microplastics everywhere because we took Coca-Cola's solution. And I think we're at a crossroads now. Are we going to take the solutions that the fossil fuel companies are putting before us and say this is the only way forward? Or are we actually going to stop exploiting and taking things? You know, we do have to keep it in the ground and move towards community-driven solutions to actually deal with the problem at the root, not keep treating the symptom. Thank you, Maria. And I want to pull Tom and Casa back into the conversation um, because... You know, the, the way I, I framed it for Maria was, you know, these these new plants and carbon capture, are obviously solutions that um, the climate justice and environmental justice community doesn't see any value in. And I wanted to hear more from you guys, Tom and Casa, just expanding on what Maria just said about um, where the answers truly lie to move toward a more just and sustainable world. Tom, I'll start and um, I'll, I'll just share quickly that um, we can talk about what's happening in Congress right now or not, or not what's happening. Uh, KFTC has been working with folks across the country um, to push for a um, hundred billion dollars to for in conditional and forgivable um, hardship loans through the rural utility service to support local communities who are running electric co-ops um, who have coal-powered plants who that need to be retired um, the biden administration was proposing to put forth 10 billion of that and what we do know is that the build back better plan has not passed and so what that means is that these local communities, these, these local leaders who are running their electric co-ops um, are in debt and they can't, they don't have the funds to invest in the solar projects, um, the creative solutions that local communities have. And so we're stuck in this, in this rut. Um, and what we're hoping is that we, we have a Congress that they can dream big and think big and the risk to to not invest is 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 the you know they talk about us and our communities as risk. I'm building 
um, a local food co-op, a grocery store in my community. And folks talk about it being risky because we haven't seen it in our community. And what I say, I push back to the funders and to the investors is that the risk is for us to not try anything new. The risk is for us to continue doing the same things um, and to continue putting money into the same folks and not investing that money into the folks who are uh, facing um, mm -hmm. the effects of climate change every day. That's the risk, is not empowering local people to come up with the solutions. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the, the August uh, 2021 uh, um, intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. And which has, I don't know, is uh, it, it has a peer group of what, over 2,000 scientists and experts in climate change. But that report, uh, I think the term was code red for humanity. But it said, it said what uh, we in IEN and Climate Justice Alliance and uh, have been saying for years, uh, we need immediate action on, on, on energy to move from a fossil fuel economy to a living regenerative economy. The report said that countries need to end all new fossil fuel exploration and production and shift fossil fuel subsidies into renewable energy. Otherwise, uh, you know, the world, the United States, you know, we're not going to achieve the 1.5 Celsius goal and uh, it's going to be out of reach. That's serious to us uh, within our indigenous communities in the north and the global south. It, it's business as usual with fossil fuel development and its vast transportation system, whether it's tanker travel, whether it's railroad, or whether it's pipelines, such as uh, what uh, Biden did not uh, uh, stop with line three in bridge coming through my backyard. Uh, the world's biggest banks have pumped a staggering, what, uh, $3.8 trillion into fossil fuel industries over the past uh, five years since the 2015 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, the Paris Agreement. So, you know, it, it, this new report, uh, uh, you know, it is very re revealing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're very concerned about the tendency of the non-government organizations, the ones that uh, assert themselves, they're well-funded. They're the ones that get the attention on, on media. And uh, so we're seeing this alarming tendency towards politics of desperation, where, court, where opportunistic uh, dis disaster capitalism coupled with the short-sighted carbon market and geoengineering techno fundamentalism are driving the pandemic of corporate false promises and greenwashing. I call these climate false solutions. So, you know, we do need media to work with us, with our Climate Justice Alliance, with IEN and our, our, our Black People of Color movement in exposing these climate investment schemes. That's what they are. Most of these are characterized as uh, techno fixes market mechanisms, and also the extreme energy projects that are being uh, in, you know, passed and, and, and supported by this administration, all claim to address climate crisis while avoiding the underlying drivers that were spoken to that got us into this uh, mess in the first place. Uh, economies of greed, uh, endless growth, uh, erosion of biodiversity, and the exploitation of life and uh, deflections of responsibility from rich historical polluters. So we have seen this dangerous slide towards uh, lawless capitalism, where free market ideology is uh, privatizing every aspect of our lives with virtually no uh, public oversight or accountability for their profiteering. That as indigenous peoples, my consultation with the spiritual leaders uh, both in Canada, U.S., and also in the global south, is that, uh, you know, the privatization of carbon and methane, of air, and the trees and carbon offsets, because you know, that's a violation of the sacred. Before you can trade uh, these elements in a, in a, the, in a market system, you got to determine whose property right it is. 
So it's a property right issue. Who owns the carbon? It's the corporations. So that's why we have to speak out on these and, and, and uh, call out these mechanisms of carbon pricing, such as cap and trade and carbon offset regimes. Now it's being rebranded as nature-based solutions. And we can do a whole session just on why that, what that is on, on natural climate solutions that's being pushed and regenerative agriculture that's bringing carbon soils into the mix of these discussions. So, so we have to really, you know, start, continue to speak out on these. Uh, from our communities, we do have solutions. And uh, as indigenous peoples, uh, we cannot privatize and sell Mother Earth, sell nature, sell sell the sky. And uh, we we got to we got to educate uh, the uh, the audience out there, and uh, that uh, we have to really be focused and looking at real solutions that's going to stop the, uh, the 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 release of. Uh, uh, emission dangerous and uh, toxic emissions. Thank you, Chet. Um, I just want to follow up uh, a little bit on what you you mentioned earlier there, which is you know we um, those of us who cover climate change or are working um, in environmental justice, etc. You know we follow the, what the scientists are saying um, and. One of the things in the report that you mentioned, Tom, in August uh, from, of last year, um, there was there are a number of scenarios laid out by the scientists about, you know, where we would be on a, you know, business as usual trajectory, uh, you know, where it would be if there was some action taken. And almost all of the scenarios included carbon negative tech. And so there's there's that coming from the scientific community in addition to this timeline, this very, you know, scary timeline. And so I wonder how when you're when you guys are talking about um, and and fighting against false solutions, how you deal with the timeline element, because I'm sure that's thrown back at you often. Um, how do you how do you sort of argue back on that? Well, yeah, I can jump. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, because I, I feel, you know, one argument I also hear all the time is we have to try everything, right? And what I hear when people say we have to try everything, they've been talking about like green hydrogen, right? Like let's just put the word green, that makes hydrogen okay. Renewable coal, renewable natural gas, right? Like everything. Is just being greenwashed. That's their try everything scheme. And then their try everything is let's try untested technology, right? Untested technology, which is what carbon removal and those technology fixes are. They're untested. We don't know that they'll be true. And so when the community, the scientific community makes these projections, they're basic if this works. And this is where I feel like, you know, aren't we in the movie and we're going to put our hands <laughs> in the hands of the, the scientists, even though, like Tom said, indigenous communities, black communities, people of color, low income folks. We've been saying we're in trouble in the iron bomb. We've been flooding for decades, you know, and it's only getting worse. And when we say try everything, we mean, let's focus. Let's put all our political capital behind stopping the bad, which is false solutions. And then we can also build the new, right? We need to go into just transition, which means getting workers good jobs, fixing up our communities, letting us dictate where money goes in our communities and being trusted as stewards of the land that we live on. But go ahead, Tom. Yeah, right. Uh, what you said, Maria, is right on. And uh, Yeah, I, I hear those kind of terminologies. You know, that report, you know, looks again it is it, kind of triggering again this politics of desperation and but i feel that i've seen it i started to get involved in the u.n climate meetings uh following a mandate of our our native communities and our elders our spiritual leaders our women and our youth in 1990 as a convening uh held in albuquerque um and uh so i was together to negotiate how they're going to save the planet from the climate crisis. And it was a learning experience. And at the front end, I think I started to really 
see or think that, hey, these world leaders and their advisors, that especially the industrialized countries and the World Bank and the financiers and the and the oil industry, always in the hallway, you know, it sounds like it's solutions. But after years, I started to see that no. And the, the recent decades uh, coming up with terminologies like carbon neutrality, uh, nature-based solutions, uh, net zero emissions. We got to be very tuned in to, to looking at is this, what is this terminology? And like Maria said, it is a form of greenwashing. It's Climate Justice Alliance and IEN, uh, we, 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 we put together a, a report, a publication to, to give layperson's de, uh, description and learning on, on carbon pricing. And it is complex. It is complex. In my years of going to the UN, working nationally and internationally on these, there's only a few non-governmental organizations that fully understand these false solutions. Many others just joined the bandwagon. I probably can count the, on, the, uh, on my fingers of both hands uh, the so-called experts within NGOs that are embracing this. And they got, uh, they got big money on comms and media. They're pushing it, World Bank. And uh, so net zero emissions, it sounds like it's cutting emissions, for an example to zero, but it's not. Net zero admissions uh, pretends to remove pollution with these false solutions that we talked about and only moves for pollute towards moving more. It does not cut, these false solutions do not cut admissions at the level that we need. But it's, it's again, reports like that are selling uh, a false solution again, uh, and it only is increasing solutions. It's telling us to trust in the report that as we see Shell and BP, uh, Exxon Mobil and other big oil giants claiming to move towards carbon neutrality, moving towards net zero emissions, is that it's only a mechanism. And we're seeing that in reports that it's in, they're increasing the drilling and the burning of fossil fuels and then washing their hands of responsibility for the climate crisis and storage mechanisms. These, uh, these uh, techno fixes uh, uh, are, are I, I use hard terms, I, they're, they're scams. They like, like manipulation of the stratosphere and solar radiation experiments. Uh, these techno fixes are, they're unjust, they're, they're, they're unproven and they result in, in human rights violations that do not address the, the root causes of climate change. Again, this topic, you know, it could be a series of webinars, uh, definitely on, this, on these issues on, uh, as we're looking at uh, uh, real solutions to address this, this climate issue. Thank you. I'm gonna bring in Casa because it looked like you were ready yeah, to jump. I just, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a simple country girl. And, you know, for me, what we do know is that what's tried and true is an economic system that uses black and brown bodies for, um, as an externality to our economy. We're, we're unaccounted for and, and, and thrown by the wayside. And we know that that's not working. What we also know is that through, through centuries and, and decades and generations, that people have been working cooperatively together to find ways to connect us, to value each other, to value our land, and to find solutions that work for us. And what we know is that those kinds of things have not been invested in hardly enough. There, you know, you can write a twenty thousand dollar grant the same way you can write a twenty million dollar check to invest in real solutions in real people. So it's time to stop playing the games. It's time. Um, to, to face the reality that what has been tried is not working. <laughs> and it's time to invest um, in people, in real people who have the real solutions. And just following up on that, because environmental justice was 
a term that was heard very frequently on the campaign trail this last election cycle, um, mostly in the Democratic primary and then from Joe Biden, um, at least in one debate. And, you know, there were, he's got his Justice 40 initiative um, and, and promises to, to have money flowing to communities. Um, and I'm curious what you, what the three of you are seeing on the ground of all the, the promises that were made, you know, a little over a year ago, um, and how, how you're either able to use that or, um, you know, how it's affecting your communities. I think the Justice 40 initiative is exciting. It's, um, if, if it's, if it's, um, held to, uh, the promise to make real investments in real people, not us being the benefits of someone else's um, testing of, of some other thing that we are really invested in. But I, I will say that I'm um, disappointed, uh, <laughs> to say the least, in, in President Biden and his administration. He had a, a, an opportune um, time the other day to really speak to everyday Americans and to speak to the grassroots about the challenge of our democracy being at its, being under attack. If, if we don't center voting rights right now in this moment, right now in this moment, we're gonna lose the opportunity to do any of these beautiful things that we know are gonna work in our community. And so what I've heard over and over and over again from the Biden administration and for democratic leaders is this placing the game on Republicans. Um, when we know it's our collective responsibility to strengthen our democracy. Um, and we have to do that right now in this moment. There's um, elections coming up in, in, a off, in an off year. And again, the president missed an opportunity to really speak to, to, to Americans about the importance of sending good people to Congress. He didn't, he missed the opportunity to do that. And so it's just been, it's been devastating to have this, this, um, you know, pointing the blame um, in this kind of, you know, childhood high school fight in Congress when real lives are at stake. Yeah, I'll jump in about Justice 40 because Justice 40 is 40% 40 of investment benefits. And obviously I think what people on the ground want to see is 40% of investments. So, you know, this is why I would encourage every agency they're going to have a lot of power to determine what Justice 40 looks like for them. That means that for everyone who's talking to EPA, to HUD, to Department of Interior, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, you know, we need to be speaking to them. Every agency has a responsibility to the communities they serve. And all agencies need to remember that they serve communities and that their job should be to protect the most vulnerable. And for that, we need guardrails. You know, we need guardrails to ensure that governmental money it's not being used to subsidize, like Tom said, climate, climate scams, right? That the Justice 40 isn't something like, I'm going to go experiment on a community, call it a benefit, and then we'll check it out later. You know, we want this cash, uh, this check cash now. Um, like Cassia said, we want good representatives, and it is our job collectively to make out demands and to make Justice, Justice 40 as real as we can be. It's not something people give to us. It's something our communities have to make real in the, at the end of the day. Yeah, this uh, this makes me think about, you know, this, this situation, you know, for one thing, our speakers, we all been talking about the urgency of the climate crisis that demands a rapid reorientation of our society away from fossil fuels. And uh, and but, you know, there's there's public investments that uh, continue to be created uh around fossil fuels, and it's going to have a tremendous impact on our ability to make this transition. The Biden administration has ignored uh, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee recommendations, and there's uh, members on that come from frontline communities. There's members in that advisory committee that are uh, Black people of color, Indigenous, that come from the universities. They come with tremendous knowledge with our community people, uh, but the uh, Biden administrations have ignored their recommendation. Uh, and, uh, and there's going to be more, more of this discourse from the higher branches of government on environmental justice. We see that, but uh, taking action is, is lacking. For an example, the, uh, more than what, uh, $12 billion 
uh, for carbon capture and storage has, has passed in the bipartisan infrastructure package in this past October and uh, signed into action by Biden in November. The White House Environmental Justice Advisory Committee advised against funding for CCS because of their environmental justice impact and negative impacts and, and with, with piles of research submitted that demonstrate that it's energy in, in, uh, inefficiency to reduce emissions. But the administration totally ignored it and went ahead to provide funding and extend tax breaks. So these are issues that, uh, you know, we want to lift up. You know, prior to 2021, the fossil fuel industry was already uh, on the receiving end on the schedule to collect $120 billion in fossil fuel subsidies, subsidies over the next decade. So this is happening right now. So, so this massive fossil fuel giveaway is compounded by another legislation the Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act, which provides uh, $27 billion as a start in funding that is going to be either directed to, uh, for fossil fuel projects or that runs the, the risk of being co-opted by the industry. So this is what this is what our frontline communities, this is what our indigenous black people of color, low income uh, communities are facing. There are big funded uh, multi-million dollar NGOs that are pushing this, uh, trying to push it down our throats. Even there's some uh, initiatives to try to co-op and try to divide our communities with big money saying, hey, we'll give you money to support these and, and, and contributing monies from uh, carbon markets uh, to, towards uh, just transition initiatives. And so they know their war room discussion as NGOs pushing this agenda know what can divide our movement, our communities, and, and we're doing everything we can to speak out on this. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go to, we do have a few questions from um, the audience who've been listening to, to this really, really um, vibrant panel. Um, so I'm going to pull one, which is actually kind of definitional. So it goes back to kind of the beginning of the conversation. Um, Elizabeth mentioned a just transition in her comments. And I believe a few of you, I know Maria has, um, just over the course of the last 45 minutes or so. Um, I wonder if one of you could take a quick moment to define that for the audience as one of our audience members was asking to, to hear from one of you about um, how you conceptualize just transition. In my community, um, we use just transition in a half part of our state, but in my community, I've just been telling people that we are at um, a crossword roads and our economy has to change. And it's time for some of us to stop working. It's time for some of us to be invested in and to take a break. And it's time for some of us to work harder. <laughs> um, you know, the folks who are offering um, false solutions, it's time for them to take a break and to take a seat back. And it's time for new people to be invested in and to have the opportunity to test out their ingenuity, to test out their talents, to organize their communities, to create the kinds of things in their communities they wanna see. Um, it's, it's about honoring equity. It's about making sure that what is good for the planet is good for the people. And it's, it's, it's an economic system or, or a transition that doesn't prioritize profits, that the profit is investing in people. Thank you, Maria, did you wanna jump in or should I, I can go to well, another. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I love the question, right? But the climate is going to force us into a transition right like it's going to people are desperate it's going to force a transition in that transition justice is not inevitable right transition is inevitable justice is not um so that's what i think about with just transition it's like we face a transition into a world with corporate overlords that control everything and have commodified the earth and the sacred or do we want a transition to the world we want to live in 
where people have equity, where people are not being exploited, where the earth is not being exploited, and that we can live in a more equitable society that has opportunities for us all. Yeah, I think the, um, the viewers can go to a couple of websites. Uh, IEN is one of the founders of the Just Transition Alliance, and uh, you can Google search that. Uh, this was back in the late 90s, and there was a need uh, to work with the unions and the workers who were concerned about their health, literally dying in these toxic uh, facilities, and they've been asking for benefits and solutions. And and so we, we came together with, the, with those uh, 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 facilities, the union, the workers, and bringing the fence line communities together because there was a divide that was created. Okay, what we're always trying to fight for is uh, hooking people up. And so it was bringing fence line communities together with the, with the workers around uh, developing a solution to stop toxic, stop, toxic releases. And if that means that uh, they have to transition out of that, then what is that transition? And, and, and economic transition for those workers and communities. So uh, on our IEN webpage, if you, Indigenous Environmental Network webpage, you'll find the Indigenous Just Transition, the principles of Just Transition. We had to dig deep and find out what does that mean to us as Indigenous peoples here in the United States. And part of it is just to, is a process of decolonization, you know, and uh, looking within our strengths of our traditional knowledge on redefining what our economic uh, goals are, our economic development is in Indian country. Even looking at how we merge in the use of natural materials, local materials for the building of our homes. Looking at uh, and other bringing in clean renewable energy uh, microgrids, local production of our own energy and redefining what, what our energy needs is. And even uh, developing our own uh, utility uh, systems, our utility electrical systems that's, that's based upon recognizing our, our rights and as, as indigenous peoples, our sovereignty. The Climate Justice Alliance also has a landing page on just transition as well. So there's a couple places there that uh, you can utilize to get more information. I can go on and on on a lot of the elements and components, but uh, those are some good uh, websites you could go to. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask for this is sort of a, a lightning round because we're almost out of time. Um, but one of our uh, audience members asked uh, how you can tell if a project that is coming to your community is part of a false promise of sustainability. So I'm curious, like if you can. Who's can't championing the project? It's easy. Who's 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 got the <laughs> microphone, and who's championing the project? Mm -hmm. Maria, Maria has a good story on that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, probably too long for this, but it's all about who is funding the project, who mm -hmm. asked for the project, right? Um, what is the solution it's trying to get at? Is it addressing the root cause? You know, that's a big thing to point out root cause versus the symptoms. We have to stop treating the symptoms and get to the heart of the issues. All right. Thank you all so much for your time. This was a really, really illuminating discussion. And um, I was so glad to be able to meet and be in conversation with all three of you. Um, I want to thank everybody out there on the internet for joining us. Um, and, and for the questions, uh, I'm sorry, we did not get to all of them. There were, a, there were a few more great ones. Um, but I want to thank you guys again for your time. I want to thank you for your impactful work today and wish you good luck as you guys move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you.